Yeah. I'm very happy to introduce our guest speaker today, uh, Thomas Thornton. He is from the University of Oxford, uh, from the Env Environmental Change Institute. So um, I have to tell you that Tom is not a linguist. He is the director, uh, and I'm really proud of that actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, he is the director, actually, of the uh, graduate program in environmental change and man management. Uh, he is a senior research fellow at the, at the uh, ACI, at the Env Environmental Change Institute. His training uh, is in social and cultural anthropology. And uh, he has uh, uh, worked uh, very extensively, as you will see, uh, uh, in areas uh, related with uh, human ecology adaptation, local and traditional ecological knowledge, and I think that what you will hear today uh, would really resonate with all that, and of course with uh, conservation. Um, he is interested in conceptualizations of space and place, um, and of course uh, this sort of links up with political ecology of resource management, and particularly uh, his work has concentrated uh, in the uh, indigenous people of North America and the circumpolar North. So it's very timely, isn't it, just when we're getting close to December to talk about the circumpolar North. <coughs> and in the course of this uh, research, uh, uh, Tom has uh, come across language. And it is uh, his explorations <coughs> Uh, and interactions with uh, language that will actually, uh, it, it, that is actually the basis of his talk today, which is on the uh, oratory uh, of uh, uh, the Tlingit people uh, from uh, North America. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Candide, and to the seminar for the invitation to be here. Uh, I am from a school of geography, so I've got a couple of maps, but we're not going to be fixated on maps for the duration of this talk. Um, but one, one of the maps here, the one on the, on the right, your right, is uh, Tlingit territory, which lies within this map of Alaska in the southeast. Okay, it's the tropical part of Alaska, uh, if you might say. It's a rainforest environment. And it's the northernmost area of the so-called Northwest Coast culture area. Uh, this other map is a, a map of the state of Alaska divided by regional corporations. And um, this is actually uh, the institution I'm interested in studying now is Alaska Native Corporations. They are business corporations that were created to settle land claims uh, more than 40 years ago in 1971. And, um, to be a legitimate institution in Clinket country, you, you have to justify your existence and you have to justify it on the basis of your relationship to other institutions. And one of the ways you do that is through oratory. So believe it or not, even from their corporate officials, uh, Clinkets expect good oratory and their standards are very high. And uh, I, I, what, I, what I hope to do today is introduce you to some of those standards uh, through one speaker who was a person that I knew very well uh, <coughs> who died last year. His name, his English name is Clarence Jackson. His Clinket name, I knew him by the name Askak, which uh, was uh, a clan name from my own adopted clan. Uh, he belongs to an eagle clan, which is one of two moieties in Clinket social structure. And uh, I'm going to give you a little primer on Clinket social structure, just enough so you linguists can appreciate uh, what we anthropologists get excited about, kinship, uh, who was a very good or orator and was also uh, one of the few traditional Clinket speakers uh, on the corporate board of directors of this native corporation that I'm interested in. And he became a very kind of pivotal person in helping to legitimize the work of the corporation within, shall we say, the continuity of Clinket culture. And uh, it's a bit of artistry how to do this, but you have to do so within, within the rules of, of oratory. And uh, I, <clears throat> I'm not even an expert on oratory, and I, 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 I really would bow to my predecessors uh, and contemporaries in, in Clinket studies, but we have um, 
wonderful people who've worked on Clinket Oratory. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the work of Richard and Nora Dauenhauer, uh, but uh, they've written books about Clinket Oratory, uh, most of it based on the very traditional kinds of, of oratory. And I have been a student of their work, and unfortunately, uh, Dick Dauenhauer just passed away uh, a few months ago. So uh, let's dedicate this talk to Dick and, and to Clarence, who uh, both helped, I think, further our understanding of Clinket oratory. But uh, I think you could say most of this about oratory in general, but maybe not all of it. But certainly, um, oratory is a, is a restricted and formal kind of speech. Uh, it's occasioned by certain events. Okay? At Oxford, we have an oration uh, every spring where uh, some distinguished person gets up and says in Latin what the year meant uh, to, to Oxford. And most of us can't understand him, so there's an English translation which uh, can be read. But it's important that it be done in Latin, or part of it be done in Latin. Uh, and it be, it's in, an important occasion, the spring graduation. Uh, <clears throat> it's not something you hear every day. You hear it at Grace, some colleges, including mine. Uh, it's also relatively conservative in form and content. Okay, the rules, there are rules of oratory. You can't just say anything. Uh, there are ways of beginning, ending, uh, so, so on. Uh, it's heightened. Uh, in, in Clinket, they sometimes call it high Clinket, uh, what, what's called oratory. Uh, and again, that means it's a different kind of speech. Uh, and it may be restricted in terms of what you can say, but even the way you say it can be important. So a uh, high speech is usually said in a loud voice. <coughs> And uh, a lot of oratory is actually given by women in Clinket, and there's nothing like an old, seeing an old woman who, uh, and I'm thinking of one in particular, who has Parkinson's and barely whispers, and then when she's going to make a speech, all of a sudden she stands straight up and gives magnanimous gestures uh, to her audience, and the voice goes up several decibels. Uh, so it's, it's elevated speech designed to elevate, you might say. It's also empowering in the sense that it's, it's, it's ev evocative uh, in the Clinket context of spiritual forces, um, that you are literally evoking their presence when you uh, speak in this kind of high Clinket. And obviously you're, it's designed to inspire, to breathe life into the people you're speaking to or about. Uh, and also it has purposes of, of uniting and strengthening people and to moving people to uh, towards a state of transformation, an emotional state of transformation, or what have you. Um, and it's also representational. Uh, and so metaphor can play a very important role in, in oratory, and it does in, in Clinket oratory. Uh, and by, by metaphor, I simply mean representing one thing in terms of another. Okay? Uh, and it's also represent, representational in terms of intersubjectivity. Uh, most uh, oratory, certainly Clinket oratory, tries to represent community and identity in very specific ways. Okay, and uh, so all of this can be done in English uh, according to kind of Clinket rules. Okay, and what's happening in in Clinket country is you've got a population of about twenty thousand people, and uh, you have about only about a hundred speakers uh, who are fluent in the language. You have uh, quite a few who are uh, passively bilingual, that is to say they understand Clinket but don't speak it or speak it haltingly. And then you have a few dedicated people, um, including my co-author on this handout, if you've gotten this, uh, Ishmael Hope, who I would say are the, the young and up and coming who are learning it as a second language but are becoming fluent. And uh, they're quite interested and hungry, you might say, for oratory and oratorical skills as well. Um, <coughs> So, here's what, what you might read in the literature on Clinket oratory from the Dauenhauers and others. Uh, okay, th there's this idea that it's elevating, it can inspire, it can unite, it can move, but of course the opposite is also true. It's a double-edged sword. You can also hurt people with, with words, and words are strong and uh, can injure. So an orator in Clinket is often referred to as uh, like someone carrying a long pole, okay, and if you're just incautiously swing around, you're going to hit people and knock things over. So you have to be careful how you wield it, uh, particularly if you're inside of a, of a house, which is where most ori uh, oration is done. 
Um, and there are some nice things that people say about people who speak well. Um, this, this quote here uh, is re referencing the fact that when you speak well, it's like a cloth being gently spread out on a flat surface. Okay, so it, it feels good. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it uh, sort of creates a pathway or a surface or a field uh, on which you might want to uh, tread or lie down or rest, be comforted. Uh, another term, that this was the title of uh, Sergei Khan, a, a, an anthropologist who works among the Clinkets of his uh, dissertation. It's called Wrap Your Father's Brothers in Kind Words, which is essentially one of the rules of oratory for a potlatch. If you're all familiar with a potlatch, I'll say a little bit more about it, but this is the uh, very important ritual among Northwest Coast peoples, uh, particularly commemorate, commemorating death, where uh, all sorts of business is achieved. You end a grieving, you, uh, you um, assign a succession of, to, to the person who died, a new leader takes his place, and so on. Regalia is transferred, names are transferred, people are adopted, lots of things, lots of businesses transacted at potlatches. Um, but one of the most important things that you're, you do is you, um, uh, you speak to the opposites, your father's brothers. In a matrilineal society, your fathers are the uh, people are the opposites. And you try to wrap them with kind words. So that's, a, that's an oratorical expectation. And then, uh, this one, which is maybe the most important, katuu uh, ke uh means people gain spiritual strength from good words, from uh, from oratory. Okay, and myself, I've been interested in it. I've been interested in, in ethnogeography and uh, entered it through the linguistic domain of place names. But uh, place names and landmarks can be very important in oratory, and often are used to establish what I've called a linking landscape to kind of unite people um, through a, a traditional landmark and, and events that occurred there, which are usually of, of great importance to the, to the clan that's speaking. Um, okay, so oratory has obviously changed, but it's still considered the most powerful way to mediate between time, space, and what you might call the social order. So it's alive and well in many respects. Now, Here's the part about Clinkett's social structure, okay? The main message to get is that it's complex and getting more complex, not less complex. So uh, I've divided uh, it into six levels um, in, in thinking about uh, how the matrilineal system works. Um, even the person is, is really a unit of, of the social structure because the person consists of components, some of which are inherited, you might say. Uh, so the person is already a social being from birth. But the main ones are, are traditionally are these. The house group, which is literally based on the idea of people who are living in a, corporal, uh, in a uh, cooperative corporate house, and that was their economic unit and their living unit. But even after these uh, houses, which were large clan houses, essentially, even after they more or less disappeared from people's dwelling spaces in villages, and most people live in modern, you know, uh, 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 single family houses, you still belong to the house group, okay? So everyone belongs to a house group. And uh, house groups all fit under clans, and there are about 70 plus matrilineal clans, and every clan fits under a moiety, okay? And so the moieties are basically super clans. And moiety is just the French word for, for half, right? So you've got two sides to the social structure. You've got ravens and you've got eagles. And then you've got, obviously, the nation. But the nation is a very weak part of the social structure. Uh, much stronger is the, uh, is the clan, and I would say in the modern context, the, the village. Uh, but as I said, this is the traditional, there is such a thing, social structure. And so already it's complex. But later in another slide, you'll see it goes up to 13 levels, okay? And this creates additional uh, stress on orators <laughs> to try to link and mediate between all of these levels. Okay, so as I said, the, um, the primary ritual, I think, which, which, in which uh, oratory is maintained is the so-called so potlatch, or in Klingit, they call it kuik, and a kuik is uh, derived from the, the Klinket verb to invite, 
uh, and that's what happens is uh, after a prominent person has died, um, the opposite side takes care of what are called the funerary rites, and then a period of one to two years afterwards, the, uh, the, the host clan, the clan to, the, to which the person who died, the deceased, belongs, reciprocates through a potlatch. Okay? And the, so the, the, the memorial potlatch ends the period of grieving uh, through a part that's called the cry, and then moves into, you might say, doing business and renewing the, the lineage. And so the person who, who has died, uh, someone may replace them as a clan leader, someone may get their name or names uh, through adoption or naming ceremony, um, and the, other, the opposite side will be thanked for their services in the funerary rites, for basically propping the clan up when they were really suffering, for bolstering them. And you can imagine the emotion that goes on, because you have to effect a transition in this memorial potlatch where you're moving from grief, even after two or three years, into succession and the new order. And oration is a big, big part of this. Okay? And uh, so this is one from, this was supposed to be the last potlatch, because they tried all kinds of things. You may know the history of British Columbia and Alaska. Uh, Christian missionaries in the state tried to uh, put an end to potlatching, because they thought it was uh, heathenistic and, uh, and, and creating all sorts of social problems that went against the, the new order they were trying to create. So uh, in Sitka, they tried to uh, end it in 1904, um, and I would say not very successfully because this is in 2012 and 14. These, these rituals are still alive and well, and they actually begin about this time of year, usually in fall time in October, and there's usually at least uh, 20 or 30 major ones held each autumn. And um, at these parties, I would say most of them have on the order of 100 to 500 guests. And uh, a lot of gifts are given away. I would say on the order of five to $10,000 worth of gifts are given away to the guests and often a lot of money. Um, at the last one I went to, it was about 25000 U.S. dollars was uh, given away to the guests. Uh, so they're a big, a big economic uh, engine, but the main purpose is essentially to, uh, to, to uh, lay this person who has died to rest permanently and to begin the succession of, of, uh, of the clan and their recovery. Okay, that's not the only time potlatches are held, by the way. They also have them for house raising, uh, for marriage and so on. But the memorial potlatch is the dominant one and the most important for oratory. Um, again, just to, to, to give you a sense of how it works, um, this is the traditional clan house I was talking about. And it was in this house where you displayed your, um, what are called at u in Tlingit. Uh, these are owned things, sacred possessions that are, uh, are symbolic of your lineage and its distinctions. And uh, so that would sit here, traditionally, and then you had a fireplace here. And in a ceremonial context, um, in an everyday context, the, the sort of noblemen, there was a stratified society, the nobles would, would live in this area and the commoners closer to the door. But in a ceremonial context, the space becomes divided or stratified according to the moiety. So the guests, um, if their eagles are on this side and the hosts, uh, the ravens would be on the other side, and, or vice versa, depending on, on who's hosting and who's guesting. But the general, the, general, uh, uh, the general purpose of a potlatch, I would say, is, is summed up by what happens to soap berries in a, in a potlatch. This is give you a visual. Okay? You start with a very little bit of wealth and sentiment, and then when people get together and they eat together and they speak orations, that gets whipped up and it multiplies, okay? So you want to multiply good feeling in a potlatch. You want to move from, from mourning to celebration and you want to be able to transfer lots of gifts and have those gifts reproduce in the future as reciprocal gifts. Um, and I always wondered why soap berries, which are really a kind of an 
bitter tasting berry, nobody's favorite berry, are so important in potlatches, but it's really the symbolism of what they do, which is really what a potlatch is trying to do. It's, it's, it's trying to multiply uh, communion, communitas, good feelings, and wealth, positive emotion, and so on. And so, uh, obviously things have changed, as I said, so these large houses, which might accommodate 30, 50 people, um, are now typically built as community houses and not as clan houses. And most clan houses today are much smaller than that, not big enough to support a potlatch with 200, 300 guests. So they will have those typically in a gymnasium or, an, or another kind of hall, but they still produce, I'm sorry this isn't coming out well, the same kind of heraldic screens. So this is one that was, was uh, so we say, unveiled and dedicated at a recent potlatch. Um, and that would have been the same as the one on the right, at the heraldic screen that would have fit in a house. Um, but they still make them uh, the same way. Okay, that's uh, just to give you an idea. And these things are, um, the regalia that's dedicated tends to be the, based on the crest or the sacred design that uh, the clan has. And many of those designs refer back to geography. So this, for example, is a, uh, a landscape, uh, the first one I ever investigated in. It's called Sitko Bay, Alaska. And so the, these are copper shields that are represented here. You can see it as copper shields. And here, that's a real place called Tinaguni. It's a copper, means copper spring water. Um, this double-headed raven, which is represented here, is another sacred place uh, called Yehkatuku, which means uh, raven's cave. And, um, and the salmon, which are uh, here, are representative of a very productive sockeye stream called Gatini or Red Salmon uh, Creek. So uh, another way to read this is that these are titles or deeds of trust to traditional territories that get passed on. Okay, so uh, backing up a bit then, so the potlatch is to pay off all those services that the other, the opposite side, the other moiety did for you uh, when you were suffering grief, when, when the person died. So that part of the funerary rites is, is referred to as condolence oratory. And this is very important and it, it's still carried out uh, in a very traditional way. And uh, so on the handout, on this, um, in this article, you can follow along with this, but I uh, didn't reproduce on the slide the uh, Tlingit, but you can follow it on the uh, second full page of your handout. Okay, so in this case we have a very prominent raven person from the raven moiety who's died at age 101. Uh, one of the most prominent figures in uh, southeast Alaska, a man named Walter Sobolov. And Clarence Jackson, whose oratory I'm focusing on, is um, of the opposite moiety. So he is appearing to essentially comfort Walter Sobolov's clan relatives who are grieving, okay? So if this works, I'm going to play the whole thing in Clinkett, and it's a very restricted kind of oratory, um, and it, it revolves around, uh, again, these, these blankets uh, or regalia. It doesn't have to be a blanket, but in this case, it's a killer whale blanket. So uh, pay attention to how he evokes that image. So just, just to uh, tell you a little bit about that, it's very classic, I mean if you'd have heard that speech a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, by all accounts it would have been very similar. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular structure where you reference all of the opposites, you say that we're here for the, you as your outer shell, your opposite side to bolster you essentially, uh, and to give you comfort, and then you, you evoke your own regalia, your sacred objects to comfort, uh, wrap around your shoulders, give you warmth, and also to catch your tears. There's a, an important dynamic in Clinkett about not letting people's tears hit the ground, uh, which, is, which is important, as you'll see in the second 
speech. And so often it is a blanket that's used, but not always. Sometimes it's feathers uh, uh, that may have to do with another clan's crest, like a bird or something like that. Uh, and, the, and it's all about comforting them. It's very strict. You don't say anything personal. Obviously, there's not humor involved. Um, and it's said in a very solemn voice. And uh, Clarence has a wonderful kind of baritone voice. Um, and the other clan is, is comforted by these words. And often, once you've done that, you go behind them and you, and you hold them, you know, to show you're standing, standing behind them. Um, OK, so that's, I would say, that's the very, very classic kind of uh, condolence oratory. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to tack back to this now. OK, now I told you that social structure gets more complicated. Um, I don't expect you to memorize this, but if you remember, my previous one had, what was it, six layers? And now we're up to 12. Uh, but we haven't subtracted any. Okay, so we've added in the 20th century, we've added Alaska Native Brotherhood camps. Um, and these were camps that were essentially a political organization that was sometimes described as the first civil rights organization in America. Long before Martin Luther King, we had, we had leaders in Alaska who were fighting for civil rights with success. Uh, but they were founded in 1912. And one of the things they did was they built halls in villages to replace clan houses. And so the emphasis went away from the matrilineal clan and on to the community as a tribal uh, entity. And, uh, but these became uh, venues for hosting potlatches, and they still, they still are. Um, but the A and B uh, actually eschewed traditional culture. They kind of were founded by a lot of converts, Presbyterian converts. And so they were very wary of clan-based uh, structures. And one of the ways they wean people away, you might say, from clan-based structures is through oratory. So the oratory of unity. So the same oratory, but for a different purpose. And he said, now we have to stop uh, being divided by clan, and we have to come together as both um, village communities and as regional entities, as Alaska Native brothers. And they, in fact, didn't even limit it by ethnicity, Clinkett ethnicity, by Alaska Native ethnicity you can join the Alaska Native Brotherhood or Sisterhood if you want. Uh, and in fact, even women can join the Alaska Native Brotherhood. It's happened. After that, so that's in 1912, the bigger um, changes are the, the IRA Tribal Governments, Indian Reorganization Act, that's in the 30s. But in 1993, they all become so-called federally recognized tribes and become essentially sovereign governments uh, recognized by the United States. And then uh, in 1971, you have the development of village and regional corporations. So, uh, so f every, every village now has an A and B. Uh, it has a, uh, an IRA, tribal government. And it has a uh, village corporation, if it's a native community. So those are three new socio-political structures uh, put on top of the existing ones. And then uh, you have these regional corporations, of which see Alaska as one. Um, so as I said, that makes things more complicated. Um, and uh, when you get to funerary rites, it means that uh, you have many more uh, what I would call, following Michel Callon, hybrid forums, where you've got a kind of cultural service going on with, with very traditional clinket oratory, and then you have a more sort of Christian or ecumenical memorial service that may involve other oratory, and then you have um, you have uh, separate ceremonies uh, that may be put on by various churches and so on. Um, so, uh, but the, the dynamics of it are still very similar. So I want to jump now to, uh, I'm not going to do this uh, condolence oratory, but um, for the second individual that died that I'm talking about, another prominent individual named Herman Kitka, uh, Clarence was the same clan as him. So in the condolence oratory, it would not be appropriate for him to speak. It would have been Raven speaking. So uh, here's an example of one thing that was said um, that's very similar, uh, referencing a blanket, this blanket called the Gunakha uh, Hu. Uh, Gunakha is a uh, 
sacred landmark to one of the raven clans. And she explains the, what the blanket means. In Huna, there's a cliff where the birds nest. When a loud noise is made, they fly away. When they come back, it's like a white blanket covering the cliff. May these things comfort you, okay? Uh, the sort of white feathers is, uh, is, is, is a kind of reference there. Um, so that's the kind of comfort that was spoken. And then you get a response. In this case, Clarence was responding on behalf of the eagle side, one of, one of the people who responded. And uh, he says, thank you. Your words are helping our hearts. But he also paid tribute to the, um, to the person by saying, uh, losing this person was like having a mountain that slid away. And, uh, and he uh, equated it to uh, what what had happened in the past in his own uh, area when there was an earthquake and, and this mountain slid away. And he says, that's, that's the way I'm feeling now with the loss of this person. Um, so he's very much on the grieving side. Um, and I, I was going to say more about the ritual oratory of this, but it's, uh, as I said, it's, it gets quite complex and you have multiple services. But the cultural service still takes place along the same lines as the first one I showed you. Um, but then others may, may take up different themes. Okay, but now I want to jump to the memorial potlatch. So this is two to three years later when the clan essentially pays back the, um, the other side. And uh, as I said, they may bring out new regalia. This is a killer whale uh, screen that was brought out. Uh, there'll be lots of gifts that are given away. So right here you've got lots of fruit and, and food gifts, a lot of uh, canned and dried fish, blankets and that sort of thing, and, and also money. Uh, and they're honoring, in this case, a Kaguantan uh, man, Herman Kitka, who is uh, the same moiety but a different clan uh, than, than Clarence. Okay, so I'm gonna play um, a part of this. And uh, so the dynamic here is the, <coughs> you have this period at the beginning of the potlatch which is called the cry. And at the end of the cry, <coughs> that's the end of the comforting by, by the uh, opposite side, okay? And then the hosts proceed to thank them. And they start by doing it in a kind of solemn way, saying, this is what you've done for us. You've helped us stand up again, et cetera, et cetera. And then they affect the transition and it becomes more of a happy, a happy time. So Clarence is on the opposite side, this time speaking for the eagles to thank the ravens for having uh, bolstered them with during this cry. <clears throat> play this whole thing, so I'm going to actually skip ahead, but I can't do it on that uh, screen. So I have to, uh, sorry, I have to do it this way, apologies. <coughs> so I have to remember where to put it here. Yeah. 
Okay, sorry, I'm going to have to fill in a little of this because uh, we're running short, shorter on time than I thought. But uh, so he's telling the story about this war party, right? That they try that the the, the people see it's an uncle and his two nephews, <clears throat> and the war party passes them. They stop on an island. The war party passes them. Then they turn. Uh, they uh, they come back, and uh, they they. Uh, the sons stage essentially a fight on the beach against this war party and both uh, sorry they're nephews of the uncle both nephews are killed uh, by the war party and then the uh, they leave again and during this time the uncle is in the woods so he hides in the woods to witness what's going on but he's not seen by the war party <coughs> and he buries his uh, nephews and he cries because there's nobody there essentially to perform that rite that the opposite moiety usually performs to take care of the body and to give you comforting words so he cries uh, as he buries them and then the war party has gone away but they turn back uh, because somebody says wasn't there one more person there maybe and so they come back to get the uh, the uncle and went further north they take him prisoner, hostage, you might say. And maybe after a day or two, they turned around and they started back. And when they came to the beach where he had buried all his nephews, he asked, <laughs> I need to go ashore. So, there was an old person, so they, 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 they knew he couldn't get away. So they took him ashore. And he started running away from them on the beach. They quickly surrounded him. He knew he couldn't outrun them. But he ran on that sandy beach anyway. They took him aboard the boat. But God, okay, the beast caught you on the woods. What a sail. It was a lucky in sheep. How could you imagine that you would outrun us? A young man asked. He never answered. For a long time. And the young man asked again. Why did you think you could run away from us? Finally, as if he asked the question the first time, he said, I'm glad you asked. You see, when we came around that corner, he said the sun was rising, and I could see my tears all over the beach, shining like diamonds. I could see all my tears when I cried. And I know if you chased me, you would push my tears off sight. And so I ran around among my tears. And you, you helped me. So that when the people come here, and when I come here, I won't look at my tears again. But I will have a memory of them. This is what you're doing with us tonight. People. You're walking on our tears. And pretty soon it'll be all gone. And long ago they stopped the story, they didn't tell the whole thing. But nowadays I tell both sides. And I want to thank you folks for 
coming because you see our tears never left, left this throne. They never left this throne for our uncle and our cousins. And today, Okay, so um, my computer seems to have locked up now. <laughs> this tacking back and forth, it doesn't like it. Uh, let me see if I can kind of, uh, let me see if I can figure out what's going on here. PowerPoint seems to have crashed. So. Ah, I don't even see it here. Okay, let's try that. Oh, doesn't like that. I'm sorry, it's not, not letting me come back. <laughs> now it's not responding. Microsoft. Okay, but you see in the... Um, ah, okay, maybe it'll work again. Um, let's get rid of that. Let's try to get this back. Uh, I'll have to go down to here. So we can start from there. Oops. All right. Dare say. So, yeah, well, I think that speech speaks for itself. There's a, a, a little bit of clinket in there, but it's mainly just to say the things the way he heard them. Uh, but otherwise, the story works quite well in English um, uh, as it's told. And again, the tears are very important because in this case, <coughs> the opposite side was not there to catch the tears or to comfort him. So the tears froze on the ground and were left unattended. And uh, it's up to the, to the man to fool his captors and go back and stamp those tears into the ground. And then uh, uh, that makes them, in a way, more lasting. Uh, they can't sit there exposed. Uh, it's too, too devastating to see them. Okay, so now I want to move to a, a couple of um, examples of more modern oratory. And uh, hopefully this won't take too long, and I'm not, I, I can sort of cut them down, because they're, they're a little less um, formal than the other kinds of oratory. They're more freewheeling. Um, but what makes this interesting, I think, is you, it's the same individual. That's Cl Clarence Jackson. You've seen him on a very somber side. Uh, doing very traditional tasks within both the condolence rites and the potlatch. Now he's uh, engaging as a corporate leader in a kind of a different setting where there's still an expectation for oratory, but uh, uh, the rules are slightly different. So a little bit of context. So Sea Alaska Corporation is, as I said, it's a modern business corporation. It was a Fortune 1000 company in its heyday made most of its money from cutting down trees because even though the Clinkets were maritime people and built their own wealth on fishing, they were given no water rights uh, or fishing rights, but they were given land uh, as a resource base. And so what they were advised by their consultants was to start a timber company, cut your, cut your most valuable timber and sell it in the 1980s to Japan, which was paying a high price for it at that time. And. Uh, <coughs> And that's what they did. They made money, and when they made money, they began to think more about the cultural aspects uh, of what they were up to. And one of the things they did was they started a Heritage Foundation. And uh, there's now a kind of mythology around how the Heritage Foundation was started that goes back to an oratorical statement made by George Jackson, but another elder named uh, George Davis. Um, and they held a conference uh, of elders 
and a lot of, you might say, traditional knowledge and oration was, was brought out. And at the end of the conference, the, uh, this gentleman spoke and he said, in Klingit, this is just the translation here, we don't want what you did here to only echo in the air how our grandfathers used to do things. Yes, you have unwrapped it for us. That is why we will open again this container of wisdom left in our care. And then they, uh, in effect, charged Sea Alaska with taking care of this, uh, these, uh, these precious things, okay, narratives, uh, regalia, and that sort of thing. And they created this nonprofit heritage institute, the corporation did, as a nonprofit to carry out this work. And so they've been doing that. And one of the things they've done is they've created new rituals, okay? So the potlatch is a very traditional ritual. It's very clan-based. Uh, and uh, the corporation was very careful not to tread on that territory. But at the same time, to have legitimacy as a cultural institution, they felt they wanted to create new, ri new rituals. And so they created this biennial ritual called celebration uh, to essentially showcase case traditions and customs of various Southeast communities. And uh, that's song and dance primarily, but also arts and crafts. And it's grown uh, exponentially, really, since its origins. And today, you might see 55 plus different dance groups. Sometimes they even invite one from Hawaii or New Zealand. Um, maybe 2,000 dancers and about 6,000 people attending. So it's a major cultural event that happens every two years in June. But they're very careful to say that it's a new tradition, it's not a memorial potlatch, and they don't want certain things that happen in memorial potlatches to happen in this, in this new ritual. Because, in part, it's more lighthearted, it's not so, so serious. It's not that it's not serious, but it's not uh, occasioned by death and commemoration, which are very serious events. Um, and so it calls for a different kind of of oratory, essentially. Um, and interestingly, I, I've been studying corporations, and one of the amazing things that's happened since I've been studying them, which is since about 2008, is um, that people like Clarence Jackson, who essentially, when they became boards of directors in these corporations, felt the need to sort of put on the coat and tie and look the part of a board of directors by the uh, early 2000s are, are putting that stuff away and putting back on their traditional regalia. So, th so this is a, a portrait of Clarence in the 80s, I think, or early 90s. And then this is him in the 2000s as, as the corporate photograph. And it became just as important to, to uh, be essentially a clinket person in clinket dress as it did to appear like a credible corporate board member. Um, and some clinkets see this as a kind of adolescence and growing up. When they went through infancy and adolescence as a, as a corporation, they flirted with all kinds of things. Uh, they got into plastics, they got into wood, they got into uh, casinos, all kinds of enterprises. But at a certain point they realized, look, if we're going to be a corporation, what we have to think about is what we want to sustain. And this began a very serious values clarification exercise on what it is that they want to sustain as a corporation. What are their values? And uh, it led to essentially a reconceptualization of the corporation as the house, which was the original Northwest Coast Clan Corporation, the communal house. And they, they envisioned the, um, the, corp uh, the corporate mission in terms of a house with four posts, these four central house posts, and each one of those being a, a value. And uh, Sea Alaska actually represents Clinkett's Haida's and Simshian. So this version is the Clinkett version, but they have it in all three languages. And what are the values? Well, uh, sustainability, of course, is in the middle, but the pillars that they want to sustain are Ha'ani, which means our land, Ha'atlatsin, which means our strength or well-being or health, uh, Ha'ashagun, which is our heritage, but it also can mean destiny, our fate, and then Wuchyak is uh, something like balance or uh, reciprocity, and it's, it's, it's a kind of an abbreviation. Um, so this is what they came up with, and uh, you know, lots of corporations have very nice mission statements, but this one is, is conceptualized in a very interesting way, and what they've said about doing since 2012, was it? Yeah, that they rolled this out at a shareholder meeting, is they've been trying to embed this basically into their businesses and their planning. And it has created a, a kind of different 
set of priorities. And uh, one of them is they're investing in culture. So they've got uh, 20 million plus tied up in a new cultural center uh, to sort of correct what they built in the uh, late 1970s, which is this iron and glass box uh, <laughs> that could be the corporate headquarters for any corporation. Uh, and the new cultural center they're building very much along uh, a Clinkett architectural model. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of background to this. But at the same time, they're trying to essentially suggest these values as part of the celebration. So they're at the celebration, which is a celebration instead of dance, arts, and crafts, there is an expectation of oration at the beginning. And there was a time in the 1990s when they used to sort of bring governors in and senators, and it was a very sort of political introduction. And uh, some clinkets who were not happy with the values of the corporation and the way some people were getting wealthy and some people weren't actually began to rebel against the corporation in the context of celebration. And so they got more intentional, you might say, about uh, their oratory. And uh, so here's Clarence again as a board member. Um, let's see if this works. So oh, it's going to open up. Do we have internet? Okay, sorry. It's uh, speaking about strength. Hot <laughs> The Alaska Heritage Institute, the Alaska Corporation, the Art Trainer, the Art Wuhan, the Tagua is our to sit on. Okay, this is the same as the Condolist speech. He's calling out the clans, sometimes called a genealogical catalog. He's calling out the clans, saying, where are you? And they're responding. <laughs> this guy's a board member who's whispering, don't forget <laughs> this clan, this clan. <laughs> and all the rest of you Adis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Adi means children. So here's a real difference. So he's allowed to use humor in this setting, uh, whereas in the in the other oratorical setting, it would be a, a real sin if you left people out and you'd have to apologize. But here he can kind of make light of the fact that there's so many people in the audience. It's not a ritual setting, so he doesn't know which clans are out there. So he just says, all you other uddies, which means all you other children of somethings. Uh, I'm not going to bother trying to name you all. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead and just play one excerpt from this where he talks about strength, but I've now forgotten where it starts. Okay. I know you're not tired judging by Irene Pradovich dancing this morning. I asked my grandfather, now kiss on, how, how come the older people were so strong? He didn't answer me for, for two days. Maybe I was nine years old. What made them so strong? And one day we had a Harper day. We had a nice breakfast and he said to me, how? He said, you asked a question, grandson. I said, how come they were so strong long ago? He said they were strong because they sat in the ocean when the ocean was smoking in the winter. They were strong because they swam 
in the morning to strengthen themselves. And the reason I asked that question when they were taking our killer whale drum down from the interior, an uncle of ours, Jimmy George, said that the young people were directed to carry the killer whale drum on land. They didn't want it to get wet. And so a bunch of young men volunteered this great big box drum. And I didn't know what a box drum was until much later in my life. But they were carrying it through the woods and over the hills. And, and they were singing this song. Nobody knows how to sing except me, I guess. Anyway, the ones in the canoe answered, they were singing to encourage the ones in the woods take it over there and the ones in the woods were singing bring it over here somebody would run ahead and clear the path and he said here's the path and sometimes the old man said one man would run with the drum great big box he would run and sprint through the woods and then other times three or four of them would carry it and what gave them that strength is the reason why I asked I know you're not tired so I'm going to keep telling the story and so my great grandfather said they swam including him and, 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 and they, they never, I noticed later when I thought about it, they hardly got sick. Where everything that comes along, it seems like I catch it. I told my brother Henrich Kadik, it's a good thing you're not a lady, you'd be pregnant all the time because you catch everything. <laughs> he was in the hospital constantly, this poor brother of ours, he's still running around. But anyway, he said there's a story about a young boy. Okay, I'm going to skip the other story um, because I don't think we have time. Let me see if I can go back to this. No, it's doing it again. Okay. Um, and I think I'll, we don't have enough time, I think, to do the last one. So I'll, I'll wrap up now. But the last one I was going to show you is a, is a tree cutting ceremony. And again, it's Clarence Jackson, but this time it's an, another new ritual initiated by the Sea Alaska Corporation when they go and cut their first tree of the season in the spring when the snow clears. Um, they now perform a ceremony and they give the first tree to a local carver to make a pole. And the, and the carver gets to choose which tree they cut first, and then they donate the pole. But it's... Um, it's a bit like this past piece of oratory, if you want to call that oratory, I would, uh, where there's a formal invocation at the beginning, but then it becomes much more of a free form where he engages in personal reflection about why it's important that Sea Alaska is involved in the timber business, the benefits that it provides, how those benefits get translated into people's careers, particularly with, as concerns scholarship benefits, and, and, 
and also how trees are conceptualized as people. And so he uh, speaks to the trees uh, briefly uh, to essentially ask for their, uh, for their gifts. Uh, but again, it's a, new, it's a new ritual in the sense that there were, there were always ceremonies when you cut a tree to make a canoe or for a house post, but uh, never for a timber corporation uh, about to start its season. Uh, and uh, uh, the other speakers, none of, none of the other speakers spoke Clinkett, so it was really up to, to Clarence to uh, make the connection. So um, uh, I don't think we have time for that. So I will just wrap up by, by summing up the, uh, the three kinds of speeches and looking at some of the elements. Uh, I think in all, all of the oratory, reference to Clinkett values is central. Okay, and so whether, you, whether you're talking about the most traditional conservative form of uh, condolence oratory or the very modern Sea Alaska rituals, uh, referencing values and referencing heritage is very, very important. People expect that. If that element wasn't there, it probably wouldn't be Clinkett oratory. And so all of them do that, I think, in very, very similar kinds of ways. But beyond that, there, there are potentially significant differences. All of them uh, engage in some kind of ge genealogical catalog, that's what the Dauenhauers call it, and what I would call a, a geography of respect. Um, so in the, uh, in the last oration, which I didn't show, Clarence, who's not from the area where they're cutting, uh, takes a few minutes to say how his relatives used to come down to Klawak uh, and how his aunts are buried there and so on, and, and how they always like to come down uh, to Klawak and uh, he, he uh, mentions all the relatives and how they're connected to the people who were there. Uh, but it, it's not incumbent that he speak to a moiety or, or an opposite clan uh, because that context doesn't exist. So the only context is really the Quan or the, or the village itself. And actually this is a source of tension in the corporation because the corporation owns land in many different communities but it doesn't have to ask permission to cut trees there because it's private property, <laughs> essentially. And uh, most people in the corp who live in the villages are the corporations, but not all of them. Uh, and that's, that's a bit complex to explain. Uh, <clears throat> but so that's an issue of how you, how you engage in a geography of respect as a corporate uh, official. It's a bit tricky. Um, Ancestral invocation is very important in, in the potlatch. Uh, it's more commemorative in the, in, the, in the corporation kind of oratory. Metaphor, very important, maybe optional in the others. Uh, forming a linking landscape is also, I would say, optional, but a good, good oration, even at the corporation level, does, does that well. Uh, Clinket language is obviously very, very important in the condolence rites. Uh, this is a very restricted kind of speech, and, and you, you have to name your blanket as if it was a person that it's actually acting with the ancestral spirits behind it. And it's much easier to invoke that in, in Clinket than it is in, in English, um, uh, because uh, even the term blanket just sort of connotes a ma material thing. Um, so, but uh, in the corporation uh, rituals, speaking Clinket is, is, is important maybe at the beginning and at the end, but, but most of your shareholders are not Clinket speakers. And so it's almost inappropriate if he spoke only Clinket in front of that celebration audience. Uh, he, has to, he has to either have it translated or introduce just phrases. Uh, reciprocation is obviously very important in the traditional context, but limited in the corporate context. Uh, personal, uh, you notice in the, uh, in the context of the condolence oratory, there's no reference to I. You would never sort of insert a personal anecdote in there. You're there to perform a very particular bolstering function and you do it on behalf of your entire clan. Uh, even in the response, it's, it's limited, but he has license there to tell a story and he did, but it's obviously not a story about him, but about uh, his ancestors. And then in the ritual, it's almost, it's almost um, uh, requisite. So, you know, when he tells the story about learning about 
the strength of the ancestors. Why were the old people so strong? It's a very personal kind of story. This is how I learned about Tlatzin in my, in my days growing up. Um, and then humor is very, very important in, in modern oratory. I think, particularly in the corporate setting, it's, it's almost requisite that you don't take yourself too seriously. Obviously, in death, things are very serious. But in, in secular life, in the corporation, it, it's almost demeaning to be too serious. People will mock you. So by, by engaging in, in, in humor, by saying all you other uddies out there, uh, you're, actually, you're actually endearing yourself to the audience. So I would say it's, it's an expectation. And people who don't use humor and are too serious usually don't get as high marks for their, for their oration. So, all right, and then I'll finally, I'll end by, um, this was um, shortly after Clarence's death, you see, um, sorry, he's cut off. He looks whole in my screen, but uh, this is an editorial from a newspaper by a young, younger Clinkett person who's learning the language and learning to speak. And he's uh, really uh, emphasizing that it's important to be strong because he heard this speech by, by Clarence Jackson. And he says, we really need to apply this, and we need to apply it by speaking our own language. And he suggests that, um, uh, that, that the, what it takes to bring us together as a culture is actually embedded in our language and embedded in our grammar, uh, using this example here of uh, how people say, I'm going to make myself united with you all, which is one of the phrases that's uh, very commonly used in, in uh, oratory. Um, so as I said, there's, uh, I think there's a lot of motivation among young people, uh, all people, to hear this kind of oration, but uh, also among young Tlingit learners, and it's a very difficult language to learn uh, because of its sound system and its grammar. Uh, there's a real desire to learn how to speak high Tlingit so that you can evoke and move people in these kinds of ways. So I'm not worried about Tlingit oratory. There may be Less of it that's totally in clinket, but I think the basic principles are, are uh, alive and well. So I'll stop, stop there. Uh, some concluding thoughts, but I'll let you read them because I think I'm over time. So thank you for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, at that ritual, uh, or sorry, at that, uh, s that gathering, uh, the um, elders conference in 1980 or 80, 80 1980. Uh, that's when they really became involved in language um, revitalization and documentation efforts. And part of it was that a lot of people made speeches at that conference in Klingit, and some of what they said is we're afraid all of this is gonna be lost and we want you to take care of it. So language, documentation, and revitalization became, I would say, a major focus for Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. They had two full-time people involved in it. Richard Dauenhauer was one, and his wife, who was a, a Clinket woman, who's a fluent speaker, Nora Dauenhauer, was the other. And they produced, as I said, a, uh, a set of classics in Clinket oratory. It was mostly the traditional narratives. Um, not so much modern speech like what I'm showing you. Um, and those are some of the best books uh, on oratory. And, and Richard was a real gift in the sense that he studied, you know, Russian, Ger German, Finnish, and he studied narratives and Homeric uh, myths and metaphor and so on. And he, he said, Clinkett has all of these elements and does it just as well or better. And uh, so there's no reason to to uh, not appreciate this stuff to the highest level. And, and there was something that really used to annoy him is when traditional Clinkett stories got reduced to children's narratives. So, you know, they would show up in an el elementary school curriculum, but not be taken seriously by adults. Uh, that is just adult learners, not, not adult Clinkets. And uh, that used to really annoy him because uh, usually you had to strip the stories down of, their, of all of their contextual details, including things like place and references to relatives and all of that. And, uh, and he thought that was really doing violence to the narratives and perpetuating this sort of primitivist idea about indigenous mentality, basically. Uh, 
but yet when you really looked at how they use metaphor, and I hopefully you got a sense of that from the oration, it's really pretty, pretty amazing stuff what they what they do. Does yeah. any of that play a role in the celebration, so that you have oratory performances? Yeah, they're, they're, in language? Uh, it's starting to. So now they do have, uh, <clears throat> it's good you brought that up. I've never been able to witness one of these, so I don't have any footage. But <clears throat> as part of the language classes now, they have a, a Clinket oratory contest every year, and it's judged by elders. And uh, so people can enter, and they have to write or really memorize a speech because one thing you never see Clarence doing is reading a speech. That's bad, bad to do, bad to do in an oral culture. <laughs> you have to face your own. So they have to learn it and speak it, and it's it. They're marked on how, obviously, how well they speak clink it, but also how they present the oratory. So um, that's going. I don't think it, it, it's. I think it's getting increasingly popular, but it's still limited audience for those events and probably limited participation. But it's something that's. Uh, I would say growing. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering um, whether you had any difficulty uh, gaining access to the oratories. Uh, you said yourself you haven't, wit you haven't witnessed one. Um, but was, it, was it difficult to be able to? Um, yeah, I haven't witnessed one of the student events. Yeah. yeah. No, I was there at. Uh, well, I wasn't at the first oration. I wasn't. I wasn't present at that. But it was a public event. <coughs> the second one. The individual who he was uh, honoring, Herman Kitka Sr., was adopted me, so I was there. I was standing behind Clarence uh, and recorded it, but I had no idea what was coming. And part of what moved me to write about or oratory, me who is not someone who writes normally about oratory, is how that particular speech moved me, uh, because uh, it was beautiful. And he just stood up and spoke it. There were about 300 people there. I knew it was going to be good. I had a feeling it was going to be good, so I turned on my phone. This is not proper linguistic technique, and asked Clarence later if I could <laughs> if I could transcribe it because it did, didn't seem appropriate to interrupt him at the time. But uh, so, um, but that's probably the only recording of that particular speech. And uh, and the other reason why I recorded it is because he. In visiting, these potlatches go on for 24 hours, so you get a chance to talk to people. But one of the things I was learning from him was that his cancer was advancing, and uh, he didn't feel like he was going to live that long, which really surprised me because he seems quite vital. But within two months, two or three months, he's passed away from that that uh, memorial. So it's really a personal personal motivation uh, for that uh, and seeing how he really moved the audience including myself who was part of this and knew the individual quite well who he was honoring by uh, responding to them so Yeah, I think within the potlatch, I mean, my prediction would be it's going to stay quite conservative. Um, but the oratory in other settings, and there are lots of other settings, whether it's because there are these new institutions, there's Alaska Native Brotherhood, there's the tribes, and there's the corporations, and they all sponsor meetings and cultural events. And if you want to be a legitimized as a leader, you really do have to, to learn to speak. And uh, I think if you if you want to learn to speak, you'd be well served by following some of these rules that I've outlined. But but you have to be careful. You don't, as I said, you don't want to be too solemn. For example, if you're a, a corporation leader, because you may offend people. Uh, and on the other hand, you can't be joking if you're you're in a potlatch setting, or you can at certain points, but not at others. But you really have to be 
you have to be careful. So you do have to know the rules of engagement, if not the language, I think, with, with the audience. I think yeah. it's actually a really interesting issue that <sighs> native tribes in the States are grappling with. Um, the Navajo, for example, they recently had a huge kerfuffle because the president of the, the elected president of the Navajo um, nation doesn't speak Navajo. And so he could rate politically in English, but without any Navajo language. And there was a huge debate about whether this was acceptable or not. Yeah. So it's interesting that the Tlingit have kind of worked through this in some way, whereas other groups are really confronting it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure they've worked through it, because now that Clarence has passed away, I don't know if you have a, another board member who is a fluent speaker. And by the end of his career, he's doing all of the cultural relations. He spent half his life going to other people's funerals and representing the corporation. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, kind of that's what it. Usual, yeah. isn't it. You get these kind of professional orators. Yeah, I think he was becoming that. And, uh, uh, but I think he was always well suited. Um, I mean, the other thing he, um, again, I kind of wish I could have played the last one, but I, I blew it with all of my technical problems. But one of the things he says in his last oration at the tree ceremony is that you have to we have to honor our grandparents and the things I taught us. And that's a very clinket thing to say, but in his case, one of the reasons why he's a fluent speaker is he was raised by his grandparents. <laughs> and they made sure that he, he spoke clinket. So he, he had this ability of, basically, he seemed like he was a generation older than he was because his clinket was that good and he knew how to speak high clinket. And, uh, uh, and that's what people would say. Other people from Cake used to say, wow, he was lucky he was raised by his grandparents. But I know what you mean in the Navajo. There's a movie called Miss Navajo. Has it, have you ever seen that? But one of the things you have to do to be Miss Navajo is you've got to speak Navajo. And it's, I think a lot of the candidates are not in a very good position on that score. So they, they have to undergo this <laughs> drastic <laughs> learning of Navajo. And they, they follow the, uh, a series of, of these young women trying to become Miss Navajo. And the, and the language lessons are painful because it's, it's a lot like click is not in a language. It's very, the phonology and the grammar are, are both challenging. So, uh, But it's an incentive. <laughs> Just like these or oratory contests, I think, uh, can be an incentive. But I think the natural incentive is that people, people want to lead and they see uh, language as legitimizing uh, leadership positions. It's not that you have to have it, but if you, if you don't, if you do have it, you've got a, you've got an advantage. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions or comments? Should I uh, uh, say thank you to Tom uh, in your name? And uh, of course, uh, as usual, um, we will adjourn to the beautiful Institute of Education. <laughs> Right. Right. Or the uh, the South Comic Sorbonne. Ah, is that right? Uh, it is open. Uh, we did play it the other week. Was it that one ah, thing there? Yeah, I, I, it's a little dodgy to go there. Yeah. Yeah. That's closer. Is it nicer? Upstairs? Um, yeah. I don't know. It's nicer. <laughs> it's nicer. <laughs> so, yeah, six and one half dozen of the other. Yeah, it's closer. Yeah. It's probably, yeah, it's a bit more comfortable, I think. Upstairs? Upstairs, yeah. Okay, then. Let's do that. Thank you very much. Okay.